Tinara Kaita Katua, a mai te rangi ki te noko te uenua, ka pota i te ira tangata i te pō i te whaiao i te amarama a ti ai mauriora. Nau mai are mai o ki mai anō ki a tātou nei kōrero o te au o te moana. Nei rā te me i mai o ki a kaitau, koa ono mā nei, ngā rangatira, ngā kaitiaki, ngā kairanga au, nau mai are mai. A kei te me i tuatai i te matua noi o te rangi, mana ki tia e mātou e oi oi ana. A tuarua, ka toku me i aro a ki a rātou, a kua inga, a hakoa ko wai, a hakoa no hia. A kia a koe te rangatira nik, a pauri ana te ngākau ki te ronga, a te hinga o tō pāpa, a aere te rangatira ki te oki oki ngā mō tātou katoa. Ko oti tō mai ki konei, aere ki te onga kaurangi e moi, e moi e te pāpa. Me teimata mātou i karakia ki a wākatia ai a tātou nei oi. E te oi oenga moa e te mātauranga ki mārama. Kia wai take ngā mahi katoa tū mai, tū kaa, aro a atu, aro a mai, tātou i a tātou katoa. Anō reira tēnei te me i atu, anō ki a koutou. Welcome everybody to this Te Au o Te Moana webinar. It is the fourth in the series of these webinar and today's focus is on the work of the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge in the Blue Economy theme. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to Nick Lewis to introduce the session for us this morning. Kia ora koutou. Kia ora koutou. Thanks very much, Linda. The program we have for you today is a very quick introduction from me on the blue economy theme and what we're seeking to achieve from it. Six presentations from project leaders who are are driving projects under that theme. Uh, and then when they have completed their, um, their, their talks, uh, four core projects and two of our innovation fund projects, uh, we've asked uh, Volker Kunsch if he would mind asking them some, a couple of very pointed questions each. Uh, and the speakers will get a couple of minutes to respond to, to those questions and then we'll open the floor uh, via the chat. Uh, for um, anyone to uh, to join the program at that point. I have to apologize that shortly after my introduction, I will be um, leaving and uh, getting on a plane from Rarotonga back to New Zealand. So apologies to me for that. So um, Robin, can you, or Sophie, can you move the slide forward? Okay, so the the blue economy. Um, why why have we got this pro this this program running within the a sustainable seas challenge, and what are its core object uh, core objectives? What we've what we've done uh, within the challenge is to see what sees what is a, globally a a moment a blue economy moment of ramping up interest and ramping up concern for the oceans, uh, for the economies that take place within them. Uh, for the economic activities that take place within them and for their long-term ecosystem health. For New Zealand, this is an opportunity to transition our marine economy to long-term environmental and social sustainability. And that's what we're seeking to achieve uh, through this program of research. We see the blue economy as an aspirational goal rather than another name for marine economy. Uh, and our aspiration is to capitalize on, um, on all of the, all of that which is going on in the New Zealand uh, marine environment in economic terms, but we were able to, to cap, capture and um, think through in phase one of the challenge. It alerted us to the diversity of positive activity uh, and suggests that we can uh, transition to a blue economy made up of marine activities that generate economic value uh, and contribute positively to social, cultural uh, and ecological well-being. The, B, the Blue Economy Research Theme is where the, the work to achieve this is actually being carried out. Uh, Sophie, uh, Robin. Sophie, 
So New Zealand then, our argument is when we, we, we drove this, this research program, New Zealand has resources and opportunities to make this happen, uh, to make this transition happen. Uh, to what, what we have is a set of New Zealand enterprises who are embracing blue economy aspirations. We have government agencies committing to transitions thinking and to participatory and EBM approaches. We have opportunities for blue economy value creation uh, and Māori enterprises are generally leading the way. So well resourced um, and the kinds of possibilities that we see uh, for transitioning coming out of here is uh, potentially a recalibration of policy and investment from finance to, to production, consumption and so on. Um, we've gone on uh, a, a bit, but let's jump to the next slide. I'm on this one now. Uh, but what we what we managed to produce from the from the first first part of the challenge is a blue economy model that um, enables us to think about the areas of of blue econ of marine economy activity that we would like to push. And the, the previous slide had a set of those um, activities: uh, restoration economy, uh, indigenizing the blue economy. Uh, going to work a wee bit on, on the way that we do our fishing, um, ecotourism and blue tech as, as areas that we could imagine uh, a blue economy emerging out of. So this transition around uh, away from marine economy or thinking about uh, resources in the oceans as, as something to capitalize upon in order to, to drive um, export values and um, export values alone uh, and mainly around commodities to change that uh, and transition to a very different economy uh, premised on ecosystem, long term ecosystem health and community um, and, and community flourishing for want of a better term. So we came up with these four pro core projects that you've seen you see there and each of those uh, you'll be hearing about uh, today. Next slide. And then we've also funded uh, a set of innovation uh, fund projects of which we're, we're very proud, largely because we've been able to uh, reinterpret, I think, the, the notion of in innovation through the projects that we've actually funded here. So this is innovation for blue economy rather than innovation as it's often understood. Uh, so we've got have eight smaller competitively generated innovation fund projects clustered into three groups. Uh, the first is Mataranga Māori innovation, the second aqu aquaculture focused innovation, uh, and the third group there are, are blue tech led innovations, uh, two of which you'll hear about today. I'm not going to run through these projects. I've produced a slide largely so that it can sit in a little slide pack and bring together much of the material that exists on the website into one place. You can have a look at these slides later. Um, so. Uh, that's me. I, I, I hope that you'll get a flavour of uh, of the projects that, of the blue economy, and then as the as the others speak, also uh, to introduce you to how we how we think that the projects that we funded uh, are going to lead to some kind of sea change in the way that we perform marine economy in New Zealand. So each of the speakers uh, will will attend in particular to questions of of impact and the possibilities of taking up their research um, in, in the different realms of the economy from, um, from production to regulation. Thank you. So I'll introduce John Reed and Jason Mika. Um, John uh, is, is going to deliver this talk today on indigenizing the blue economy. Oh, ngā mihi nui uh, kia koutou. Um, so yeah, um, unfortunately, uh, Jason couldn't make it today. He's um, been taken up with some uh, important family affairs. Um, so I'll be presenting on this today. Um, so could we please go to the next slide? So um, just a brief outline. Um, this presentation is more outlining our program. Um, we're yet to start our research phase, but um, 
uh, we did a lot of preparation and groundwork before beginning this program. We went through um, quite a few interviews with uh, uh, Māori, um, iwi and business leaders across um, the country before developing it. So we do, we have done, uh, we've sort of entered our um, process of discovery from that perspective. Um, we've also pulled in a lot of literature and we've had our detailed discussion with quite a few case studies. Now the research program itself has, um, has three different research areas and we have case studies that are involved in one or more of these areas. And the three research areas are pahiko heko or integration, ahuia tanga or generating differentiation and whakatautika which means to generate balance. Each of these research aims um, are going to be covered um, in the following slides. So next slide please. So in this first one, uh, Pahiko Heko, um, we had feedback from Hapu and Iwi um, that there were lots of economic activities happening in their marine jurisdictions. And this included things like commercial fishing, recreational fishing, aquaculture, marine tourism, customary fishing, infrastructure investment, such as wharfs, um, that were not operating in a coordinated fashion. Um, uh, nor were they focused on uh, long-term sustainable economic planning. Um, and so Hapu and Iwi uh, were keen uh, to um, explore mechanisms by which they um, may lead integrated planning across these sectors, which led to our first research question 1A, how can Māori lead multi-generation integrated planning across economic sectors in their marine jurisdictions um, to maintain the modi of Ngā Uri o Tangaroa, uh, which means the, um, the, the children or the, of Tangaroa. And then our second research area was uh, we, we got quite a bit of feedback from the Māori commercial sector that they needed um, new structures to help with uh, more efficient fisheries asset distributions. This is because after settlement, quota were split geographically across different species for many iwi. This means that many iwi do not own enough quota species of a particular species um, to um, operate profitably. And so to get around this, uh, Māori are forming collectivization structures to consolidate their quota for particular species. However, they were interested in other mechanisms that might be able to support this consolidation process, what sort of policy policies and what sort of structures might um, facilitate that process. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Um, our next theme uh, is, sorry. Our next thing, uh, Ahuatanga, um, is looking at the um, uh, was is primarily focused on how Māori um, can diversify their economic activity in the marine environment. We find quite a lot of emphasis or uh, being put into fisheries particularly, um, but there was quite a lot of interest in moving into new areas such as investing in the development of marine infrastructure such as ports or novel forms of aquaculture um, and, and also using research and development to make economic quota species, oh, sorry, quota species that are currently uneconomic, economic through research and development or developing new marine tourism initiatives. Um, there was also interest in differentiating, differentiating current products and market through indigenous branding and sales. So this theme is interested in looking at this, this um, topic of differentiation and different economic opportunities for Māori. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So our third thing, theme, Whakatautika, is uh, referred to as, gener which is generating balance. Um, Post-settlement, um, iwi, um, uh, this, most of the assets have, have consolidated with iwi and pan-iwi corporations in terms of where the uh, marine assets sit for Māori. And there were quite a few questions, particularly from hapu and coastal communities, marae centred communities. Um, how can we be supported into developing our own initiatives at a local scale? And so um, this might be Fano um, and Hapu getting into their own fisheries initiatives, their own processing, their own tourism and so forth. But how can we get better um, uh, synergy between what's happening at an iwi scale with what's happening at a local scale? And so this led us to our final research question, how do we, how do we create employment uh, enterprises and other economic opportunities for Hana, Fano and Hapu in coastal communities uh, leveraging their assets? and influence of iwi and pan-iwi authorities. Um, next slide, please. 
So currently we have four case studies. Um, we've got Onuku Runanga, which is based in the Aparoa Harbour Basin. Um, they're very interested in uh, marine farming. Um, which they're going, uh, which they're initiating and investing in, um, but they're also interested in the whole marine jurisdiction and management of the um, and the management of different activities within the harbour. So it falls under our first theme. Uh, Fakatoa here, once again, is investing into aquaculture, but they too are interested in exploring a range of different options of what's happening in their um, in their marine jurisdiction and particularly how they might add value to their products through differentiation and exploring indigenous branding. Uh, Muri Ori and Ngati Mutunga um, out on the Chatham Islands. Uh, both are very interested in, in the marine um, in coordinating economic planning um, between each other and with others operating the marine uh, estate within their area. And then we've got the Iwi Collective Partnership, which is also interested in how the collectivization of assets, um, how, that, how that might roll out, but also the value add component, how they might get better um, value for their products in international markets through indigenous branding. Uh, next slide, please. And so our program structure is looks like this. Um, we have on the far left, we have all our specialists from the other challenge programs and they feed into what we call our synthesis team. Our synthesis team has a group of specialists um, that come together to um, explore the topics that, we, um, that we're engaging in. At the, at the far left, we've got community researchers. They're funded and they're actually operating within the Hapu Iwi Authority um, within the case studies we outlined. They're undertaking the research and then feeding that to our senior researchers. And the senior researchers uh, then feed into our synthesis team to produce the, the kind of uh, academic outputs for the program and our applied outputs to the communities and to, um, and to the uh, public more generally um, is being generated by our senior researchers. Um, so that's the, the program, I think in essence, but um, uh, kia ora, thank you for listening. Thank you, John, much appreciated. Uh, we'll now move on to hear about the Restorative Marine Economies Project. This is going to be presented by Nigel Bradley, and this project is co-led with Drew Laura. Thanks, Nigel. Kia ora tato. I'll present, we've got a fairly short amount of time, so I've got five slides that go through very relatively quickly. So firstly, I'll, I'll talk about what are restorative economies and, and why they're important. I'll very quickly look at where restorative economies fit within the broader spectrum of the blue economy. Uh, some of the outputs I'll mention, describe uh, from the work so far. So we're about, about a year into um, 20 odd months of, of work. Some of the findings and observations that we've made to date, and I'll close out with just considering how this work is looking to have impact. Uh, just before I start, also, I think it's really important, and I think Nick um, did himself a disservice. These, in listening, reflecting on, on what John was just talking about, there are really strong synergies across these projects um, within the broader blue economy work stream. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's great, and, and credit to, to Nick and, uh, and Julie and team for. Um, enabling not, not just a series of individual projects, but actually the fact that these all have, um, have alignment between them. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So what, what are restorative economies and why are they important? The, I'm not gonna bother re reading everything here, but the types of things we're talking about with restorative economies, are where we're able to bring together investment, new investment, and into uh, restorative programs or projects that are seeking, explicitly seeking to reverse environmental degradation and protect natural capital. In other words, to restore uh, ecosystems, but in a way that can generate funding. And historically, this is something that a lot of people talk about um, all around the world. This is not a, not a New Zealand specific problem, but really there's a huge gap between um, projects of all different shapes, sizes, locations that are wanting funding and the world of investment. And that, that includes philanthropy, it includes um, impact investment. There is, there is more and more investment capital out there constantly growing that is seeking to invest in things, but for various reasons that we're, we're digging into through this work is that, that, that they're just not happening. So a, a few really important points here um, that some of the benefits of these sorts of projects are quantifiable. 
some of those things can be monetized. Blue carbon is probably the most common thing that people think of when, when they're thinking about being able to generate revenue from ecosystem services, but there are lots of other examples. It's a really important point here to, to understand that not everything can or should be monetized. So we're not seeking to create revenue from everything. It's recognizing though that there are occasions when you can quantify and measure things and can generate revenue. And that's really the, the sweet spot that we're, uh, we're digging into in some, in some depth. Can we go to the next slide, please? So reasonably quickly, this is um, the, the, the pyramid here shows the difference between what we call bluing finance versus financing blue. So bluing finance at, at the bottom of that, um, that pyramid is really talking about the increasing flows of investment money into making existing sectors in the marine environment or blue environment more sustainable. So that's um, gear changes, for example, it's new technologies, it's decarbonizing, um, shipping, those sorts of things. There's a lot of focus on, on aquaculture and fisheries, but, but generally what it's easier for investors to, um, to deploy capital into some of these sorts of things because they understand them, they've been around for a while. The, the gap that we are looking at here is at the, more at the top of that pyramid which is what we call financing blue. So getting new investment into restorative projects. So um, a, a very popular term at the moment is, is called nature-based solutions. So using nature to restore some of the problems that we have, uh, what we call blended finance models, which simply means mixing grant funding with other types of investment, could be loans, it could be, um, it could be equity investment, but recognizing that there are a whole lot of different ways in which investment can occur. Um, in fact, as I mentioned before, blue carbon is a really big uh, draw card. I suggest, and certainly um, it's a New Zealand and a global thing, there's a lot more rhetoric than there is reality at the moment. But um, I think it's important that we highlight that the, there's a spectrum and there's no hard and fast thing, uh, differences here. But what we're really interested in is at the top of that, of that pyramid. Can we jump on the next slide, please? So the work we've been doing to date, uh, there are four, four outputs so far. First is just understanding what restorative economies are, what they aren't. This is uh, both global and, um, and within New Zealand. Once, once we understand what they are, what they aren't, then we've moved on to thinking more about the science side of things. So Drew, uh, Laura from Miwa led, led this second, second output, which is really understanding what ecosystem services are and their role in marine environments. The third output is a review of different financing solutions for investment in restorative marine economies. So digging a bit deeper into things like blue bonds, blended finance, as I mentioned earlier, and some of the other uh, finance solutions that have been emerging both, again, both globally and domestically. The uh, fourth output so far is a review of different metrics and tools for measuring ecosystem restoration. So we've got to recognize that it's really fundamentally important for uh, projects that are seeking investment, that they are able to, um, A, attract investment, but B, the investment is going to want to know that you are doing what you said you were going to be able to do um, in, in terms of achieving impacts. And so the, the fourth output is, is looking at some of the different ways in which um, the measurement of, of ecosystem restoration can occur. Two, two outputs to come um, over the course of the next six months or so. Firstly, there's a, a big work in progress that we're um, we're working on at the moment, which is really understanding and defining the investor needs and expectations. We need to understand broadly in the, in the world of investment, which includes both public and private, what investors do want and what they don't want. We need to understand what the different types of investors are and how those perspectives, both what they do, what they don't want, may vary depending on the type of investor whether it's philanthropy, Māori investment, impact investors, climate finance, government investment, all, all sorts of, of different things. And the, the final part of that output will be seeking the alignment between the world of investment and the world of restorative project development and trying to bring them closer together. That's the real, that's the key there. But the final output is going to be um, a case study 
at uh, using the Hauraki Gulf as at the ecosystem level. So looking at a range of different uh, restorative projects that are either occurring already or are planned within the Hauraki Gulf, developing an impact framework across all four well-beings. Some can be quantified, not all can be quantified, but we want to understand at an ecosystem level whether we can create something that is going to be able to be applied consistently across, first of all, the, the Hauraki Gulf, but then more specifically within those individual projects that um, are going to be occurring. Again, the intention of that is to see how and whether we can align investor needs with project development. Uh, can we jump to the next one, please? Just some, uh, some initial findings and observations, and um, my focus is more on the, on the side of investment than on, on the science side. But I, I think the overwhelming theme is, and it's not surprising, is that restorative economy investment opportunities are really poorly understood by the world of, in, of the investor. The, um, one of the challenges with, with the lack of awareness or understanding of the blue economy and opportunities to, to invest into things like restorative economies is uh, the perception of risk and the, the folk who are holding the capital, the money to invest, have certain tolerance for risk and certain understanding of, uh, of some of these opportunities that isn't always aligned with the opportunities themselves. So we need to be able to come up with ways in which we can identify what financial returns are possible from some of these projects. We know investors um, want scale. They, they would like to see things that are replicable as well. The, overwhelmingly, the interests globally and, and to a degree here is climate related. But actually, you really can't separate a lot of the outcomes when you think climate and biodiversity, for example, uh, or investment into kelp forest restoration provides water quality, habitat, and potentially climate benefits. And so recognizing that those, those are joined up. The, um, and sort of, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm too much of a downer on it. There is really significant interest from investors and it's partly an education program from the, um, from the restorative economy side of things, working with investors so that they understand um, the types of things that are possible but also on, uh, on our side, we need to be able to understand what they want and what they don't want. Uh, all, all, all of these sorts of projects that, that um, we're looking at or talking about have multiple impacts. And, and it's really important whilst the monetizing of things, generating revenue is, is one, one type of impact. Actually, there are cultural, there are social, and, and of course there are environmental impacts that will occur. So we need to be able to really clearly articulate that in a way that investors understand, but also that they consider as robust and, um, and genuine. Some of those impacts, as I've said earlier, may be revenue generating, but others won't, and they shouldn't be revenue generating. And I think that's a really important um, point. The final point on the slide is that policy drivers are really important. And in, certainly in a New Zealand context, if we think about uh, climate related policies that are still lagging behind where perhaps um, investors would like to see them, but the drivers when, when and if we're able to get the New Zealand's uh, nationally determined contributions, if we could get say blue carbon into some of those things, then, then you will see really rapid growth and in investor appetite to, to go into things that are gonna provide uh, climate benefits. Final slide, please. I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, just very, very quickly, the work, how will this work have an impact? So we're looking at, as I've hopefully reinforced a few times, bridge that gap between the investment and, and the projects. Increase the finance flow into projects at scale that can be replicated, reducing the risk from the point of view of, of investors. Uh, and importantly, at that, at that ecosystem scale with the, the case study that we're going to do is providing new understanding for thinking about impact frameworks at a larger scale that can also be deployed at, at discrete project scale. That is all from me. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nigel. Um, unfortunately, uh, Syrian Adams has been unable to join us this morning due to illness. And um, rather than try and um, fight our way through her presentation, I'm just going to give a very brief summary um, of this project. And what we'll do is um, in when we send out the link to the recording 
um, of this webinar, we will also add in the links to the outputs from this project. Next slide, please. So the purpose of this project is to guide the development of a high value seaweed sector, um, providing meaningful economic, environmental, social and cultural benefits to local communities, but also at the national level. This was an opportunity to look at building a new sector in our in a marine environment um, with an ecosystem-based approach being taken to that. Next slide, please. So the project has already um, produced three reports. Uh, the first focused on um, markets and regula regulations, um, what's needed in those areas. The second on um, species characteristics and Treaty of Waitangi considerations. And the third one on environmental effects of seaweed, wild harvest and aquaculture. So these are base documents and I know that um, these are being used by um, the newly formed um, Seaweed Farmers Association. So great to see they're already um, going into use. Next slide, please. Um, Accompanying these reports are a number of infographics and we will also that summarise those reports and we will also make those available to you through links um, when we send out the email. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, what this project is, is to the next uh, output from this project, and that is a framework or a roadmap um, for a range of um, stakeholders for, for Māori, for investors, regulators, um, growers and manufacturers, processes potentially of seaweed, researchers and legal experts. And this um, framework will, will list priorities, um, risks and knowledge gaps in terms of developing the seaweed sector in New Zealand. Last slide, please. What I'd just like to emphasise, this project has done a tremendous job of um, working with co-development partners. So you can see this is a list of those that have been involved in um, input into the reports to date and also into uh, the framework that's now being developed. So uh, a wide range of Maori partners and stakeholders as well as um, researchers and central and regional government agencies. So, and in the future, near future, we will um, ask Siri Ann and her team to um, provide a webinar in the Sustainable Seas webinar series um, to bring you up to date on this project. Next slide, please. So our next presentation is going to be from Simon Milne uh, around growing marine ecotourism. Simon uh, co-leads this project with Chris Rosen from Lincoln University, and I'll hand over to Simon. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, I, as I, you've just heard, I'm going to be talking about uh, marine, uh, growing marine ecotourism today. Next slide, please. So we're well positioned as a country to develop marine and coastal uh, ecotourism, uh, especially uh, experiences that embrace regenerative uh, principles. Uh, however, our understanding of marine ecotourism and how it connects to the blue economy is lacking. Uh, marine ecotourism is often overlooked by policymakers, and we don't really understand very well its connections to the spiritual, cultural, social, environmental and economic well-being of communities. So there's a lot of work to be done in this space. Drawing on Mataranga Māori, this uh, project aims to develop marine ecotourism from low impact uh, EBM principles. We're working in partnership with iwi, industry, government and community with a focus on firstly establishing a baseline of marine ecotourism activity. Uh, secondly, co-creating an actionable definition uh, of marine and coastal ecotourism. And thirdly, constructing uh, measures, indicators uh, of success um, and testing those in North and South Island case studies. I'm going to be focusing today on the work that we've already completed and then we'll look a little bit uh, forward as well. Next slide, thanks. Uh, this is just a summary of the findings from phase one of our work, which was focused on gaining a national uh, scale understanding of marine and coastal uh, ecotourism activity. 
Uh, this involved a, a web audit, uh, a review of uh, all existing operators that we could find, uh, survey and, and interviews. Um, and we've been able to identify and create a database of over 300 operators in New Zealand. The survey and the interviews certainly highlighted a, a number of key themes, which you can see in reports uh, on, this, on the challenge site and also in the webinar that we presented uh, at the end of last year. Clearly, uh, Taiao is central to success. Um, successful marine and coastal ecotourism is seen as privileging uh, Mana Moana. Um, and really, there's uh, a lot of focus on restoring the Māori of the Moana for future generations as we looked to how the operators felt about the sector. That came through very strongly. It clearly is a values-based sector. Uh, operators are very keen to pursue low-impact business models. Not all of them have reached that point yet, but they're trying to move towards that. They want to give back to communities. Um, and obviously, of course, while COVID-19 has represented a real challenge, uh, it's also for some given them an opportunity to refocus and perhaps uh, reimagine, reset some of what they do. Uh, it's also fair to say that these operators uh, embody and have a, a great deal of in-depth knowledge about local marine environments. Uh, and we found that perhaps that was an area that could certainly be uh, leveraged more by uh, policymakers. A lot of operators are very keen to be more involved in decision making and are very keen to support uh, uh, learning outside the classroom initiatives and to link more closely to education. Next slide, please. Uh, to date, we've uh, generated a range of tools and resources. Um, you can see there that there have been a number of reports produced um, last year, a literature review, and also um, two reports that looked at the, um, the national dimensions of our work. Uh, as I mentioned, also, we had a webinar uh, presentation last year as part of the Science Challenge series, and you're able to have a look at that and see where we are now and where we're going to in the sector. Perhaps the two uh, resources that have created most interest and, and have had the greatest impact to date are the top two there, a data dashboard um, that gives us uh, insight into the marine and coastal uh, ecotourism operators across the country, and also an interactive Google map, which allows us to take uh, the database and present various dimensions of it in an easily digestible form. Next slide, thanks. Uh, this is just an example of the kind of Google map uh, activity that can be generated through the um, resources that we've created. Uh, it's very easy for us to um, pull out the main activities that are being uh, provided by uh, operators and we can then look at their dispersal uh, at a national scale across things like uh, type of activity, uh, size of operation, ownership, et cetera. So it gives us a nice way to visualize the, the, the structure and look of this uh, sector. And it really hadn't been looked at as a sector uh, for a couple of decades. Um, so it's really nice to be able to get that update. And I think our operators have, have really felt very uh, pleased to be able to see the scale and size of, of what's going on in the sector. Next slide, thanks. Of course, the beauty with the mapping and uh, with the uh, dashboard is that we're able to drill down into more depth um, and to look at a, a range of different variables, including things like uh, certification, um, uh, multiple types of activities being offered, et cetera. And we can also look at and, and look at the kind of clusters of these activities and what they mean to regional and local economies. Um, this has been helpful for us. Uh, it's obviously been helpful for government and operators. We'll have a look at that in a minute. But for us, in looking at our phase two work, which is based around uh, North and South Island case studies, uh, it, it allowed us to sort of look at where these activities were concentrated and to get a feel for perhaps uh, the choice of uh, cases that might have the greatest impact and, and possible scalability as we move forward. And here you can see just two examples of these more detailed maps, uh, one focused on Auckland and, and Hauraki Gulf, uh, the other one on Akaroa, which is the focus of our, our South Island uh, case, which Chris and his team at Lincoln are, are very much focused on. Uh, next slide, thanks. Um, in terms of the impacts and, and sort of co-development partner benefits to date, um, I think there's been a, a number of them. And uh, this is just, I, I guess I just thought I would 
um, present to you some of the feedback we've had rather than sort of talk about it um, from second person. Um, it's been great to see at a regional level a lot of uptake and interest, especially from regional tourism organisations or destination marketing organisations. This is giving them a picture of what exists, um, what kinds of activities there are, and perhaps highlighting possible networking opportunities. Uh, as you can see from this first quote, some of our data also looks at things like certification, and this is proving to be very useful for, for um, managers of, of programs as well, especially around things like destination management plans, where there's a lot of investment at the moment happening from central government. At a national scale, uh, certainly Department of Conservation and other organisations um, have, have expressed a lot of interest in the work. And as you can see here, it's going to be very useful for them in looking at a number of dimensions, including integrating land-based activities and their effects on marine ecotourism. Uh, and of course, operators themselves have found this work to be really useful. It's given them, I think, a sense of how large the sector is and um, obviously who's out there and, and how they might be able to create uh, networks and links. But there's been a lot of interest also in this focus on what do we mean by success and what kinds of indicators uh, can we co-develop to give uh, business a, a greater sense of how they're progressing towards some of those value-based approaches that we talked about earlier. And this is really key as well because one of the areas of feedback that we received through our research was that there are concerns around greenwashing or maybe blue washing in this case. Uh, there are um, issues around um, perhaps people talking the talk but not always walking the walk. So there's a lot of interest in certification and how that can be applied and used and how it can also reflect um, the, the, the range of stakeholder inputs that we are, uh, we're looking at. Next slide, thanks. So the next steps for us, uh, as we are now into stage two of the work, we are focusing on our case study research. Um, the Akaroa uh, case is still in its design phase, but getting very close to being finished. Uh, here in Auckland, um, we have uh, finished our design. It's, uh, it's now in the science challenge for review. And we're going to be looking at uh, two cases. One is a, a Fano based uh, um, startup in um, uh, eco-marine uh, eco uh, tourism, uh, ma marine mammal um, watching. The other one is, uh, is also of interest, which is uh, focused on a, on a more extractive type of tourism activity, charter fishing, and uh, the attempts by this operator to actually move towards um, marine and uh, e coastal e uh, ecotourism activities, and in particular to embrace more uh, Mataranga Māori and the history and, and cultural setting of, of the uh, Gulf. So a um, couple of cases there that we're working on. We're continuing to work with partners to identify and produce useful tools and resources, and that includes also this year updating and, and continuing to work with the, the database uh, dashboard and Google mapping work that we've done. Um, we're using the insights that we're gathering to aid in the creation of frameworks and indicators. We've already started that work and produced some initial um, non-public uh, uh, reports at the moment around frameworks and indicators, but we're using the case studies to really inform those indicators and frameworks as well. So that's something we're looking forward to taking, uh, you know, to, to working on in the coming uh, few months. And uh, finally, of course, our goal is to develop and deliver policy recommendations um, that can guide initiatives at local, regional, national, and also, of course, community uh, levels. Uh, so that's it for me. Thank you very much. Oh, I should just say, sorry. <laughs> Um, this is obviously a very much a team effort. I want to thank very much our colleagues at Lincoln for their efforts and obviously the rest of the team at AUT. But as uh, Julie alluded to as well, we can't forget uh, our co-developers and our partners in this work as well. And uh, frankly, there's a few too many to list here, but uh, you can certainly find out more about them and some of the online resources on the uh, Science Challenge site. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. As uh, Nick indicated at the beginning of the webinar, um, we're going to have two short presentations uh, around um, two of our um, Blue Economy Innovation Fund projects. Um, the first from Oliver Wilson uh, from Fisheries Inshore New Zealand. Oliver. Thanks, Julie. So I'm the uh, project lead for the Quantifying Seafloor Contact. Um, as you see from the um, opening slide, 
there's a large number of people working on this project. It builds on work uh, that my colleague Brianna Bowman has done in Alaska about determining contact adjusted swept area. So um, I'll just refer to that. Uh, so next slide, please. So currently in New Zealand, the commercial trawl footprint is determined by a nominal swept area. So there are assumptions made um, around the, the contact of any one trawl event. Uh, what we're looking to develop is an empirical uh, methodology to measure the bottom um, contact. Um, and so we're creating a, a baseline of information. It entirely aligns, uh, I should say, uh, this project was developed before um, the Prime Minister's Chief Scientific Advisor's um, report on the future of commercial fishing, um, but it does entirely lie, align with empowering fishers to innovate, enabling them to make uh, decisions um, to address their environmental impacts um, based on empirical baselines, but in a cost-efficient uh, manner that is appropriate to their operations. Next slide, please. And so to date, we've developed sensors. We're working alongside ZebraTech, who are a Nelson-based um, uh, research provider. And so they they provide the sensors through the Met Ocean Moana project and also work alongside Rock Lobster and Power um, Industry Councils for data loggers. And so we've designed these, we've validated to determine the, they have tilt sensors in them to determine the level of bottom contact. And we've uh, as with any research, um, made iterations as we've gone uh, and conducted our first voyage. So you'll see in the the pictures provided, we've we've essentially reduced the surface area. We've uh, to address hydrodynamics and complications around lift to ensure that we're getting accurate data. Next slide, please. And so during that first. Um, trip we uh, trialed the sensors and houses we collected video footage of sensors in three different locations foot rope wing ends and sweeps shown by the stars and the reason for the um, camera footage is it helps us validate the actual measurements that we're seeing uh, from the tilt sensors next slide please and so this is just an indicative um, of the data analysis that we've done to date so the the graph to the left hand side shows the level of clearance um, over time and the green indicates on and red off and what the video footage has reviewed that we then look at the the sensor the tilt on the sensor to essentially categorize whether that was on or off the reason for doing this is that we only have limited number of cameras and more sensors and so we're looking to create a likelihood of what a sensor um, value is and then applying the likelihood, essentially a probability, to all the other sensors so that we can get a contact adjusted um, swept area, which is what's showing on the right hand side, uh, developing those likelihoods. And you'll see there's overlap, and so there's more work to be done there to determine the intermediate zone um, and on and off bottom. Uh, again, that's around developing of the likelihoods. I'm conscious I've only got five minutes, so apologies, it's a bit of a rush through. Uh, next slide, please. The immediate next steps to conduct two further trips uh, and a comparison of the contact profile between different gear setups. Um, we're fully aware that there's a body of international research out there about modifications um, to gear to change um, contact. But what this project does in a cost efficient way for fishers to utilize is actually provide them with a, a tool and a methodology to create a baseline. So any future changes they do make, um, they actually understand what impacts they or what contact they currently have and then the, um, what in, any uh, significant changes that they can achieve. So the reason that we're using two different gear setups is so that we can demonstrate that the sensors can determine between that. Next slide, please. So the expectation uh, around this is that we're creating the empirical baseline, as I mentioned, um, and it will support fishers to make um, their own operational decisions uh, and support their own uh, um, decision making around any gear modifications they deem appropriate to meet the demands um, and the aspirations of their businesses um, in an ever changing um, environment, um, fitting in with the comments that have been made around blue economy um, for example Simon talked about the low impact business models and so it it's empowering 
at the fish at a fisher level and, and a company level uh, and then it will be supporting them to make balance that economic activity um, with sustainable practices um, to continue to support not just reducing uh, or minimizing impacts but also ensuring um, food security moving into the future thank you very much Thank you, Oliver. And our final presentation um, will be by Matt Miller. Um, he's co-leading a project looking at bioactive potential of sea stars with um, Kura Paul Burke and Matt Cummings. Kia ora. Um, the title Pan Patangaroa Huarao can be lo loosely translated um, into uh, being fruitful or abundant in uh, potential for starfish. Next slide, please. And being having opportunity then sort of needs to be a problem. So the problem is there have been a decline in the muscle beds for um, traditional harvest of um, shellfish and um, starfish have been linked to this, uh, an increase in population of these over the last decade or so. And there's a fair bit of tonnage of starfish in that harbour itself. This is in Ohiwa Harbour up there in the Bay of Plenty. So that sort of pro uh, poses two questions. One, Starfish are meant to be there, they're, they're a native species. But two, if you're going to remove some, um, the idea of throwing them onto a tip, onto a rubbish dump, uh, doesn't sit well with the iwi or sit well with us. And we want to find out what is of, of value of these um, starfish if we were to remove them in a restorative sort of circular blue economy sort of setting. So next slide, please. We put together a team. My expertise is around marine bioactives. Kura has been working with the uh, iwi and the ecosystem up there for decades and has a real under good understanding around that. And Matt Cummings is a marine collagen expert. And we pulled together to sort of come across this challenge. So the next slide, our plan in what we're trying to do is work with the iwi up there and develop some innovative industries to fund the restoration of those muscle beds and also look at what is the potential in the starfish that if we are to remove them, what could we do with them? So it's making it this sustainable and local um, uh, and also fund that restorative management of the starfish. Uh, sitting inside the ecosystem-based model that Cura is working with this. So basically the question we're trying to answer, is there a buck in anything inside the starfish? And next slide shows that there is a market for marine um, collagen from skincare products, uh, particularly in South Korean markets, but in and, and lots of markets, there's New Zealand companies now looking at marine collagen and starfish collagen is a, a potential ingredient in that market. So next slide, we're looking at engaging with Māori and all the end users of that space. So we, we're lucky enough to have a Ohiwa Harbour Implementation Forum, which not only involves the iwi, but also involves regional councils and other engaged sectors such as DOC around that area. And we've been working with them and presenting with them on what our findings are. Also, we're aligning with another sustainable seas project that Kura runs around the ecosystem dynamics of the harbour, not only starfish, but other um, shellfish and other things that are in there. And we just want to sit inside that because if we want to take something out, we really got to know the, the impact of any of removal of starfish. So la, next slide. And we really want to, this is where it comes down to our results. What's inside a starfish that is of value. So when you take a starfish out of the water, it's mainly water. So we've got to take away that water. So these are dry weight results. And there's a, a lot of protein in there. So um, there's about 25 to 30% protein plus another 10% collagen. And if you, collagen is the thing that we're looking for. And we're able to characterize this collagen compared to a well known commercial collagen like hokey collagen. And it, it, it has a similar but different profile, which we've been able to, we believe there is some beneficial properties in that sort of uh, skincare product space. But there's also a little bit of lipid and carbohydrates and other potential bioactives in there. There's lots of work around bioactives in starfish because they lose a limb, they grow it back, and there's sort of regenerative sort of properties of being touted as being uh, advantageous in lots of industries. Uh, 
but it's also full with ash, particularly calcium. So if you look at the calcium, if here's a cross section of a freeze dried um, starfish and on the outside, there's these really nice little plates that are all calcium carbonate. Um, in between them, you might see these sort of flaky bits of collagen that sort of helps it move around. And inside, there's a whole lot of soft material, which is its uh, reproductive, reproductive and digestive organs. Um, so we look hitting these animals with a whole lot of analysis um, from toxins all the way through to heavy metals, anything that's positive or negative that could be in them. And we could see any value in it because we want to actually get the full value out of these um, starfish uh, if collagen is the product we're making what can we get with the byproducts so the last slide is what are we doing in is going to make a couple of products out of this so plant and food research has a bioproce uh, bioprocessing plant where we can make a pilot scale commercial process of these we want to make it so we can fit it into that Bay of Plenty uh, infrastructure that's already there with the iwi and using green chemistry and maximizing these yields and uh, recover value from all the side streams and to develop a cosmetic product that we can um, market and sell uh, well, the iwi can once we're giving them the capability to do this. So we're going to give the tools to the iwi so they can actually make the best decisions for their harbour and their starfish. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Matt and, and Oliver, for those very short snippets about your projects. So as Nick mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, the success of the challenge is very dependent on our Blue Economy projects um, achieving impact. And we have asked Volker Crunch to prepare some questions focused on achieving impact um, for our project leaders. So I'll open the floor to Volker and ask all the um, speakers to put their um, cameras back on. And I will hand over to Volker. Following Volker's questions, we'll open the floor for questions uh, for, from all participants. Thank you, Julie, and kia ora koutou. Um, and thank you for the honor to um, actually ask questions here. And thank you for some really interesting presentations. They all lead me to um, the point around value creation through the blue economy. And I think it needs to be highlighted that in the end, a thriving blue economy is, is a balance between healthy ecosystems and actually creating opportunity to create great value. So there are real presentations here that let me down the one path and then another presentation let me down the immense opportunity to create value. Matt, if I may start with you um, on the starfish, fantastic opportunity there to eradicate a pest species. Um, assume that we create great value with that starfish collagen. Is that then in the end possible to actually create a sustainable economy out of that starfish or a sustainable production of value from that starfish. I can imagine that in a local economy, community driven, everybody would go and then harvest starfish until that resource is possibly gone. Yeah, and this is a difficult thing about this um, program. It's actually not a pest species. They're meant to be there. Uh, they're just in overabundance, especially monitoring over the last 10 years. So the idea of removing them and trying to make value out of them Give, goes down this pathway of creating a system in where someone can over remove them and have to create their own new problems. I, I think working with the iwi and the councils is and giving them the control and they're making those decisions, I think is the right way to do it forward because they have that generational, especially the iwi, that generational thought of how can this be best for the harbour for my um, grandchildren and their grandchildren. So we're just trying to provide some tools with them and make it fun that other work that needs to be done, whether it's the ecosystem-based management or the management or the ecology around it, uh, and fund the petrol and the people that are going out there and collecting and turning these things into products. So it's, it's a dream. Um, we'll see if it can be a reality of making this circular and um, everyone happy. Um, sooner or later, someone's going to make a dollar, and um, we'll see how that ends up. Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. Simon, marine and coastal ecotourism sounds like the thing that New Zealand should really embark on. At the same time, the blue economy hosts so many opportunities. Isn't there a conflict of interest 
um, for the ecotourism sector if, on the other hand, we develop this amazing opportunity to create value from the oceans out there, while you probably desire a more pristine environment? Um, well, I guess that's really why when we are talking about blue economy, we really need to understand how these different sectors work together. And I guess that's one of the strengths of this particular program that we have, um, different perspectives, different sectors, uh, different dimensions. Um, what I can perhaps just uh, look at as an example is, is that case that I had just mentioned. Uh, we, we've got a, um, uh, a charter fishing operator who's, uh, who's really finding it now um, very difficult to operate, not just because of a, the, the tourism closures and shutdowns of recent uh, times, but also uh, the changes that are happening with the Hauraki Gulf, the uh, creation of marine protected areas, etc. He sees the value in shifting towards um, a, a different kind of offering, but is also, um, you know, trying very hard there to link into Mataranga Māori, understand how he can add cultural and other dimensions to that uh, product. And in terms of value creation, I think for this sector, a lot of the opportunities actually lie in, in understanding how, how they link to uh, surrounding culture and community uh, activities as well. So um, no, I, I, don't, I don't see um, marine and coastal ecotourism is, is sort of mutually exclusive from those other sectors. I think it's about finding ways to work together and find a way forward. And uh, certainly I know in Golden Bay, uh, when we've worked there in the past, uh, aquaculture was very much a, a marine and coastal ecotourism attraction for some. Yeah, that is very true. Um, thank you, Simon. Nigel, I would like to ask some questions around maybe the bigger picture, unfortunately. Um, we we don't have Nick with us anymore in this presentation, but um, if you look at the opportunity that the blue economy presents and worldwide you have increasing number of funds investing into anything ocean related, aquaculture, blue tech, etc. What's holding us back in New Zealand to actually embark on that with much more vigor? I think at the heart of it, Volker, it's the, the gap and the, and the, and the um, misalignment of understanding and perspectives that I was I was talking about earlier. So you, you've got lots of really great restorative projects here, as you do elsewhere in the world, and then you've got lots and lots of folk out there who want, who say they want to invest. There's there's a difference, I think, between the rhetoric and the reality. And the only way that you're going to get the money flowing into these projects is if the um, the understanding, the language, etc., from the two different perspectives can come together, so that. From, from the investor's point of view, uh, they're, they're thinking about risk, risk of this thing failing that I'm thinking about investing in or, or not succeeding as much as I'm being told it will succeed. Therefore, that means I could either not get the return I want or lose all my money. And so how do we, how do we um, mitigate those sorts of risks? And part of that is on the, on the project side is really explicitly from the outset when, when these projects are being designed is, the, is, is clearly thinking about if we know that they, the investors want things that can are either of scale or can be scaled or replicated or both. If we know that the investors are, you know, understand their primary motivations, if, if it's climate um, as their first motivation, then when we're, we're looking at these sorts of projects that you would be seeking investment for, you've got to start with that. The fact that you're going to have all of these other um, beneficial impacts is, is awesome, but if, if the money says I'm, I'm climate first, um, the fact that you've got say biodiversity or water quality or other, other benefits that you can get, that becomes secondary from the perspective of the investor. They certainly like it. Um, and, and the last thing I'd say, uh, Volker, is we that the, this is a global problem. And a lot of what we see here is mirrored at much, much larger scale in other parts of the world. And, and interestingly, I think, from an international point of view, uh, investors look at New Zealand as a great place to try some of these things, because partly because we're stable, we're relatively non-corrupt, um, relatively easy place to, to do business. And so there's a whole lot of things that are attractive if by comparison with some of the projects and parts of the world that don't have those attributes. And that, um, so it's that, I guess that notion of um, using New Zealand almost as a test bed for some of these sorts of things that you could scale up to other parts of the world. Yeah, 
that leads me to to a question that I wanted to ask: What is are there any definite advantages to New Zealand for any blue economy investor? Um, and let's say other than those that you've just mentioned, maybe from an environmental perspective, our coasts um, and the opportunities that exist already. And you, if you think about, while you think about that, um, I saw your name on the seaweed project, and um, there's quite a hype around seaweed at the moment, also internationally. Yeah. Would you regard seaweed as a silver bullet? Uh, should we attract more investment into that sector? Yes, but but I think one. Actually, I'll, I'll just ask, answer, answer the first part of your question first. I think one of the massive advantages we have here are um, the Māori relationships, and um, without wanting to put it all in a box, is we are far more advanced here in um, working with Māori, whether it be commercial or iwi or hapu level, and that, by comparison with a lot of other countries, I think is a real advantage. Just put that put that aside. The silver bullet question, um, I, I think I'm biased, so I'll say yes. Um, there's, there's so many opportunities associated with seaweed, but one of the really big um, issues at the moment, and again, it's partly global, partly here, is the rhetoric and the reality are not the same thing. And so people talk about, a lot of people, for example, talk about blue carbon benefits coming coming from seaweed. The uh, and, and potentially, you know, could seaweed be part of the emissions trading scheme in the future as a way of, of generating carbon revenue? And we're a million miles away from, from that sort of thing. It could happen. And there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening offshore, but, but we've got to realize uh, the reality is, is, despite the talk, uh, you know, we're not we're not there yet. Um, but in saying that, there are a lot of really clear benefits from uh, from seaweed. There are, um, and those are environmental as well as uh, as well as social, different business models. And, and this is part of of, of that work that Syrian is leading is considering different types of business models. Going back to what John was talking about before, where you've got things like collectives and, and cooperatives that are, um, you're seeing a lot of leadership from, from within Māori. They are the sorts of business models that can enable uh, relatively rapid scaling of a sector. We also need here to, whilst we might talk about seaweed as a, as a silver bullet or a you know, big opportunity, we, we can't and shouldn't compete with parts of the world that have been doing this for a thousand years with whatever the particular products are. And um, you know, there are farms in Japan that are a thousand years old but places like Korea, China, right, right through Asia, they're already doing it they're close to market. They're, they've got a much lower cost of production, lower labor costs. So here in New Zealand, we shouldn't be trying to compete with those things because you're never gonna succeed. So it's really part of this, this silver bullet question is how we define what we should be trying to compete in. Um, and, and also don't, don't ignore the domestic opportunity, but um, recognize that there are things we can do, we can do really well and build on those. And then there are things where we probably shouldn't attempt to participate. Thank you, Nigel. A lot of food for thought. And I hope we um, promote or provoke some more questions coming from the audience. But let's divert into the fishing industry briefly. Another important part of our blue economy, um, the bottom trawl impact study. Oli, um, have you been able to actually identify any significant differences between the current way of determining impact on the um, um, substrate and the, the sensors you are employing? So um, to date we haven't on the basis that we've been doing the validation using the cameras to develop the likelihoods um, of the sensors. So that's the next next steps is to run the two different gear approaches um, and then you can compare to determine that the sensors can detect a difference and then as I talked about we had the capability to compare the nominal swept area so the one that is based on assumptions with the actual contact adjusted um, and the methodology that we're using that has historically been used in Alaska has taken that approach so the opportunities there but it, we've got two more at least two more trips to collect the data once we've done those two trips that we, we should be able to um, to do what you suggest for mm -hmm. You mentioned on one of your slides that um, skippers can undertake gear modifications once they have a better understanding of their impact on, on the bottom. What might those look like? So, the, as, a, as I mentioned, there is a, a wealth of information around gear modifications. In fact, DOC have just um, 
can, well, I had a report written by Terry Moana that's available online that talks about a whole range of gear modifications. Um, the difference is that historically there's been no baseline, so people don't know what the change that they're making uh, and the impact that, that potentially is having. So that's where we see this project fitting in. It, it creates a tool for you and it's the start of a process, but some of the gear modifications might be changes to the bridles or sweeps, uh, maybe moving from wire to uh, Dyneema, for example, or more significant changes might be uh, a change to changes to the to the trawl doors. Um, obviously, our sensors aren't, um, we're not attaching to the trawl doors at present, but um, we're focused on the sweeps and the bridles and the, um, the foot rope, but it could be a change to foot rope, change of spacing of bobbins and uh, cookies for example mm -hmm. um, but yeah the key is we don't have a fishers at a, a base level do not have a baseline to understand what impact those changes um, might might actually have for their operations and for the demands of consumers um, I know that Rich Ford's asked me a question yep. this project is not about our project is about providing a, um, a tool that fishers and industry can use um, the individual fishers and their operations, their companies can utilize it to safeguard markets and the environment down the track. That's not a decision that we're making. We're purely in creating a tool that fishers can utilize to make decisions that are appropriate uh, to meet aspirations for their own operations. Bottom trawling is clearly the elephant in the room for the seafood industry. Um, wouldn't it be great if there was an opportunity to actually enrich know-how on both sides of the equation? Um, with the findings that you would get out of the study, is that possible? Sorry, can you repeat the question? If you were, if you, uh, do you believe that you would come to conclusions that would enable improving the know-how around bottom trawling on both sides of the equation, meaning um, the seafood industry, obviously, but then also consumers and um, antagonists of bottom trawling? Well, I think it comes back to a, a point um, that was raised earlier that... Um, sectors um, need to work together there's conflicts between not conflicts but it's about working between different sectors and um, understanding the dynamics of those um, the blue economy comes to um, creating prosperity for all stakeholders there's also an, a, a huge element of the blue economy it will be food security and it's finding optimizing food security with um, minimizing uh, environmental impact so there'll be trade-offs um, but you can't you can't make trade-offs un unless you understand um, what sh your impacts are. Um, this work is purely about creating the baseline. It doesn't go into um, trying to understand the impacts or um, that's additional research that would utilize this baseline information. Okay, yeah. good. Thanks, Oli. Um, John, um, I feel as if I need to ask you a question around restorative economies. Um, you talked a lot about the opportunity that exists out there through the blue economy for um, local communities. And um, to what degree do you bring an intergenerational approach into, into the endeavors um, that are at the moment, they sound very much value focused. Um, how do you integrate that intergenerational approach? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I think that um, you certainly, and that, and perhaps from my presentation, you got um, a sense for this that that was certainly what was coming back to us from uh, the hapu and the communities that we were engaging with at a marae scale, particularly was how um, what the activity was happening in their particular areas within their marine jurisdictions, how. Um, you know, what was the long-term thinking involved and how long-term was this economic planning, uh, given that uh, from their perspectives, this sort of multi-generational, intergenerational thinking was underpinning uh, their perspectives. Um, for me, um, you know, in, in terms of uh, how you start to build that into your planning processes, particularly when governments run off three-year Per, you know, cycles um, and a lot of their decision making. Uh, there's often uh, there isn't cross-party agreements on strategy and policy and, and into a lot of areas, particularly in regard to the environment and differences there. And simultaneously, and 
with in regards to um, the communities themselves. Oh, and sorry, in terms of the business operations themselves, often running off five-year cycles or annual plans or whatever, this idea of stretching something out for, for generations is a very different um, uh, way of thinking and a different way of orientating. Um, and there's so many mechanisms that could be employed to kind of address their situation. It could be the way in which financing occurs, the way the investment occurs, you know, attracting very long, long-term investors into the sector who are looking for, you know, those who are retirement schemes, people that are, are thinking and sort of really long-term horizons so driving uh, the direction of capital into this long-term thinking of return on capital over multiple generations I think is, is, a, is a way of thinking about it and that kind of fits in with a sort of a Maori way of thinking about it too but also within Maori institutions themselves and the corporate areas the kind of letters of intent they put toward their fisheries operations and corporations that demand a certain return per annum how could you stretch uh, which um, often discourages uh, the types of investment needed to um, shift operations into more sustainable sort of uh, uh, methods and approaches and also more experimentation so there's also pressure internally when tribes with an iwi um, you know uh, on that front to to, for that return, as opposed to um, thinking, um, you know, that investment for long term, I th certainly think the communities think that way. They want to drive that change. They want to bring the stakeholders together. They um, and they want to be able to um, have some uh, role in that long term planning and getting everyone coordinating and thinking in that sort of um, way. And I think that's where I, I think some of the solutions sit. Um, as at a marae scale um, and those who are in fact, uh, and allowing some leadership to occur at that scale um, to bring in that so those wisdom traditions that think um, in that long term and that long term way I mean those are just some ideas I just uh, um, can think of um, on the spot but I, I, I'm sure there's plenty of other things that can bring in that long term horizon into thinking and planning yeah thank you John um, we, one... We've had uh, we've had three questions from the floor, sure. all of which have been answered in the chat. Um, there's one new one just come in from David Grieg. Uh, I'm just trying to get all of it on screen. Um, I've been involved in restoration of Mahanga Kai for a culvert that was used to replace an open channel and estuarine situation driven by the Lake or Hapu Marae and funded through the PGF. This project is now almost ready for political opening. It has no commercial opportunity or creation built in, just recreational, but it could be given, given its location in the Monangi Inlet, it could have. Tourism operators see opportunities, but it has been driven through the restoration lens and they haven't been involved. Um, I would think across the work being done, your projects, the opportunities for commercial issues are not considered at small local scales, but these can add to the wider uh, Māori and Pākehā issues, um, just suggesting there could be an opportunity to look at and retrofit opportunities or set up structures for picking this up. Anybody got comments? Um, well, I mean, I've just because I see the word tourism there, I thought I'd jump in, I hope that's okay. Um, I think this is a, a really great um, comment and question, and I think that, again, it comes back to what we were saying, thinking about ways that we can cut across sectors and look for opportunities, and I think, I think tourism in particular at this point in time, and tourism operators are looking for new dimensions, um, looking for new experiences that they can provide to visitors, and looking for ways to I guess, link to other sectors. And, and, and th this is a, a great example. We are now we're, um, looking at a, um, some small uh, local scale um, business focused uh, cases. Uh, and, we are, and we're looking at cases that we hope can be scalable. Um, certainly this looks like a great example. And I know Monganui reasonably well. And I think um, some fantastic opportunities there that you've outlined in Certainly, be happy to chat further should the uh, should the opportunity arise. Thanks, Simon. Um, we have a question from Kirsty Woods um, for you, Matt. Um, if you start with the starfish research, um, does the project intend to look at future management of starfish if a commercial operation is possible? One of the key matters to consider would be the fishery settlement and the role of the QMS in managing commercial species. Um, such as starfish as a way of maintaining sustainable biomass of starfish 
and divining who can harvest how much. Yeah, um, really good question and goes to the heart of what we're trying to do here. I'm a chemist, so this is way out of my escape, but Kura has been working on the ecology of that system for 10 years and she's trying to build this ecosystem based model that this can all fit into. Um, Definitely, that's why we're working with the EWI. They've got that long intergenerational plan. We're providing them information on the starfish so they can make these decisions and how it relates on uh, in a commercial operation and how it works in that space. There's a lot of water to go on that bridge. But I, all those points that you make there, Kirsty, are really important to where it's going to go with the future and how it could be uh, sustain a sustainable biomass to fund. I think if it's done in an iwi based way, they would love to be a situation where they have their muscle beds back and uh, and not harvest any sustain any um, um, starfish and everything's sort of in an equi equilibrium that they they think that where it should fit. But um, it's it's a commercial operation, and when money gets involved, things decisions get made. So um, it's it's a long road and being a scientist and a, a a sort of a positive chemist i hopefully you know in some of those things around getting the right numbers in and out each year is really important thanks matt so um just aware um that we're just about at, at time and um we just ask um volko if he would like to make some final comments before we wrap up in terms of what you've heard thank you julie um very encouraged. Um, I must admit that I'm, I feel personally very passionate about the opportunity that our oceans hold, um, obviously in a balanced way. Um, what I feel a little frustrated about is that we seem to not getting ahead of the curve at the speed that is possible if you look internationally. What um, I find very encouraging is um, the research that's being done here. Um, and as we listen to each one of you here, um, there are certainly overlaps and these, these opportunities where I feel like saying, do you talk to each other in order to identify opportunities where you can work together and create even greater outcomes, possibly quicker. Um, and I think that's the opportunity that um, the challenge provides is how do we interact in such a way that we create these amazing outcomes much quicker. Um, a lot will come down to the synthesis that's going to happen um, towards the end of the challenge, but uh, I can only promote greater um, cooperation as we move ahead in order to, to, um, to come to outcomes that benefit our country much quicker. Um, Julie, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I think it was definitely very insightful. Thank you very much, Volker, and to our presenters and the teams um, undertaking our Blue Economy research. Um, thank you for all the participants who have attended. We will send out a link um, to the recording so that you can share it with others and the link to the seaweed um, material. And I'll hand over to Linda, Linda to um, complete the webinar. Well, kia ora, Julie, and um, just like to endorse um, your thanks to the um, presenters and uh, to Volker for the session today, um, insightful presentations and equally insightful questions. Um, it's been great uh, listening in. And thank you to all of our participants for taking the time to join with us um, in the session today. Um, kia tau te rangi Māori o te rangi e tu, e tu iho nei o papatua na koe takoto nei o te tai o e awhi nei ki rongi a tātou katoa a te hei Māori ora. Kia ora koutou. Thank you, everybody.